It's Wednesday. It's Tales from the Couch. Not on last night's games. I'll focus on one of, game, one of the games last night. I'll mention maybe a couple other things uh, from stuff that I saw on Monday. But I just kind of want to look at the 20 games in deal that we have, where things are starting to kind of show themselves, starting to settle in here a little bit. I always think, look, this is an original. There's plenty of people that would agree. 20 games in, you start to kind of get a sense of who these teams are, as we are at the quarter mark. And yes, I know I still owe a Western Conference midterm, but it's a midterm on my terms. You don't know when it is. All right, Mavs at home. They win. Uh, they are now... 13th on offense, 11th on defense. Golden State overall in the season, um, 9th on offense, 22nd on defense. But in their last 10 games, as they've started to figure their stuff out and figure out the rotation, you know, they were trying to play some of the younger guys more minutes. Kaminga's back in the rotation after having a little blip there. Um, they're 11th on defense in their last 10. So Mavs get up big here, 15-4, 23-6. And then in the second quarter, Golden State, actually at the end of the first quarter, some of the defense was figuring itself out. Golden State went to a zone towards, I think, the end of the first half there. Um, but as of today, Golden State's the nine seed, and they've gone from three and seven to eight and four in their last twelve. Uh, Dallas has basically been five hundred the entire season, so it, this isn't some big swing here. Um, and when you look at the standings, this was oddly enough the Western Conference Finals rematch was a matchup of the nine and ten seeds in the West. So there was. Um, Let's go late here because there was an exchange of shots just going on in the fourth quarter. You weren't really sure who was going to end up winning this thing. Uh, Golden State's second unit was terrific in the first few minutes of the fourth quarter. Uh, Dinwiddie got tossed in this one for an elbow flagrant two on Jordan Poole, who just going to get hit in the face, I guess, every other month here. I don't like the ejections on any of this. Dinwiddie got him really good, but... It didn't feel like it was, I'm going to elbow you in the face. And then they even dapped it up really quickly as Dinwiddie was walking off. But this is the deal, folks. When we have head trauma as the number one topic in sports talk radio for two straight years, you know, the NBA, the other leagues could draft behind all of the stuff that the NFL was dealing with, not to minimize the impact of these head injuries. But then, it, like a lot of times, when public opinion becomes obsessed with something, then it sways the other way, and that's why we see the roughing the quarterback shit you don't like or these awful sideline penalties in football. You see penalties you don't like because you kind of asked for them because you were demanding player safety. So the NBA would be like, look at all this bullshit the NFL has to deal with. Okay, let's make sure we get some sort of protocol in there. So now they're going to review every single single elbow thing and anything that looks pretty harsh, even though without intent, I didn't believe last night with Dinwiddie, you're going to end up getting ejections, which is like, okay, cool. Now we have this. Because people were so worried about what everyone's policy was as a league and as a team when it came to any kind of contact with the head. All right, so back to basketball. Luca comes in at around 940-ish because that second unit was really good defensively. Uh, DiVincenzo starting to, who was that? Dante DiVincenzo starting to lock it up a bit there. And so they're like, okay. Now, Luca comes in. Luca's an experience, right? Uh, because you know he's without a question one of the five best players in the league. He is an MVP candidate probably for going to be for 10 straight years of his career. And I've pointed out the usage rate stuff with him at times, but you know he went like five straight possessions without anybody else touching the basketball. Now, it's always going to bother me, even though it works. And you know maybe there's like a fake handoff in there where he has the ball, hands it off, and then comes back for it, whatever. To me, this doesn't really even count. And then they've tried to figure out the Christian Wood stuff at times because, you know, there's almost this national broadcast Christian Wood rule where every time he does something really good on offense, which is a lot because he is so talented on offense, but then the broadcast team will talk him up like it's some mistake that the other teams got rid of him. And when in fact, it's like, I think he's on a bunch of teams because he's sort of a big stat guy that is talented and doesn't really... When you watch Christian Wood, he, he plays, if you ask him, hey, do you know how many guys play against each other at a time? Did you know it was five and five? He might get it wrong. He plays by himself as much as anybody in the league. And that's saying something. Philly, Charlotte, Milwaukee, New Orleans, Detroit, Houston. Those were the first seven years of his career, seven different teams. Houston back-to-back -back, gave him away to Dallas for nothing. Really talented. Broadcast team always starts talking him up. And they never tell the truth about the story that he's just not super connected with what everybody else is trying to do 
Um, but Dallas was kind of desperate for some sort of big situation that could provide them more offense than Powell. But looking at it, it looks like Powell's kind of the default guy. And they were trying to, you know, in the beginning of the season, remember that Phoenix game where Wood couldn't miss? It was, it was really impressive. But at the same time, he was just like, he thought he was at a pickup game. And you're like, okay, you're gonna, this is what you're doing? So, all right, enough on that. You've heard me talk about it before. On defending Luka, it's Wiggins' primary assignment. And then when it wasn't Wiggins, it was Kaminga. That's that body type match thing that I think I think gives you the only chance. I think you need a bigger guy to try to at least cut off some of the passing angles for Luka. Good luck. Not really going to work. Uh, it also gets back to the Mikel Bridges, why you know he against Luka it just doesn't, doesn't work. He's not big enough, even though he's probably thought of as a bit. Well, he is. He's a better defender than Kamingo. Um, and then Wiggins. At this stage, Wiggins is stronger than Clay. He got Clay in a switch uh, in the first half, backed him right down, just put him right in the sidecar, gave him a helmet, and said, let's go for a ride. Um, but it didn't, it didn't really work. Like they tried to double Luca late. He went four for seven in the fourth quarter. He had Hardaway for a huge three that gave him the lead. Josh Green had a great drive. Josh Green showing like real rotation upside minutes here. Uh, Golden State was down 115, 113 left, 10 seconds left. Steph from three called for travel. That's another thing that's going on. Everybody's getting called for travels. I'm, I'm for it on the jump shot. Steph traveled. He changed his pivot foot. It was the right call. I also think Kleba was going to get in there and contest, if not sort of a backhanded block the entire thing. So I don't think the travel call, although that may have happened after after the whistle and everything was kind of messed up anyway, uh, but it was going to be a good contest no matter what. But it was the right call. Even though I've never been, a, like whenever you were talking to somebody, you know who we're talking about right now, right? Your older buddy. Maybe it's an uncle. He hasn't been married. Nobody likes him. And he goes, oh, that NBA, you know, the NBA, they all they do is travel. Like as if traveling like was ruining people's lives, right? But we'd heard that for years and years. I don't really think that's what the NBA did here by calling traveling more and calling caring more. Although the caring thing is very selective. It's like, hey, you're not any good. Yeah, we're going to call you for Paris. <laughs> the better players are not to say they haven't get called for any, but. There's dudes that are still carrying like crazy. And then when I'll see a guy get called for it, and you're like, where, what were you from? G League? Okay, yeah. Reno? Yeah, yeah. That was a carry. So it was the right call on Steph. I don't, I don't mind it <laughs> because I feel like the league was trying to do something that helped the defense here because the offensive players are getting any calls on any contact that's initiated by them. Luca got a call last night where he was driving the left elbow towards the rim and then he got some contact like body to body on the drive and then he slung himself backwards. You're like, oh, so Luca actually is too weak to not maintain his path. Like he's getting driven off of his line and bump and yeah, now you're giving him the call. Like it's one thing when Trey's flailing all over the place because he's small. The visual part of that makes you think he's he's getting killed on all these drives when Trey's embellishing it like everybody else is. But because Trey's smaller, you can see the human part of the officiating process of giving him the benefit of the doubt and giving him that call. With Luca last night in one drive, I'm like, oh, so he's getting this one now too. So I know it feels like the league, like the <laughs> guys falling down on screens, all of this stuff that sucks. I felt like the league was like, if we can clean up some of this, are we giving something back? As much as I hate the charge. If you took that out, which is what I would argue for years, and I still hate the way it's called, uh, I think you should have to be there for a beat, and then it's a charge. But this is this is probably something where like maybe we don't we we have to do something to help the defense a little bit because the way we're calling a lot of this stuff for the better players to have the ball all the time, they're getting the benefit of the doubt on all these calls. All right, so Steph's call for the travel. Uh, he moved the pivot foot there on the left. Luca goes for 40 points. It's his 20th 40-point game. That's tied for second in Mavs history with this guy named Dirk. So he's already tied with Dirk for 20 uh, for 40-point games with 20 of them. The usage of 37%. I'm going to keep monitoring this. He's behind Giannis, behind Embiid. I don't need to monitor. It's going to be in the high 30s all season long. Um, and it's been high 30s pretty much for four years. His rookie year was 31. Okay, let's look at the standings. And ask ourselves this, where are the surprises? Do we still have as many surprises as we thought we did the very beginning part of the season? Uh, not really. Phoenix is one, Denver's two, Pelicans three, Memphis, um, and that's Phoenix one without Camp Johnson and this other guy named Chris Paul. Portland's hanging in there, although not doing nearly as well as they were at the beginning of the year. But let's look at Utah. They're now today your eighth seed. They went from 10 and three to two and eight. Um, 
they they actually, if you go through it, their losses. I, this is an insane league. Now, like you, right? I was sitting there going, okay, Utah's not going to be this good, right? At eight, uh, 10 and three, which I just said. Um, the easiest way to tell the story is that when they were 10 and three, they were number two on offense and number two on defense. Since that time, November 10th, uh, they've sixth on offense and 29th on defense. There's your problem, right? Defense now is considered the second worst defense in the NBA since that time. Conley's missed five games. They can't defensive rebound to save their lives. And their transition D is even worse. So you go, hey, we don't, we don't rebound the ball defensively and then we let you score in transition all the time. I don't because marketing, it's not like some marketing drop off. You could argue he's been better this month than he was the first month. And when it's clicking for them offensively, it's actually really impressive. It's it's fun to watch. But because they're small and they can shoot and it's multiple ball, you know, I with the ball in their hands, creators, decision makers, these things that, that I rave about and talk about all the time. What you're giving up on the other end is that you're not defending anybody. There's no reason to not get back. There's no reason to not get back there. But I'll admit, when I was going through it this morning and I was looking at the losses, Washington, Philadelphia, New York, L.A., Detroit, Golden State, Phoenix, Chicago, who I like the Patrick Williams minutes lately, just his defensive activity. Watch how much ground that guy covers for Chicago. You might have, I know the offense isn't there yet. Other than the Detroit loss, there's nothing to really go, how the hell did that happen? And here's the part that really sucks for Utah. Here are their next 10 opponents. Clippers, Pacers, Portland, Golden State, Minnesota, Denver, New Orleans, New Orleans, Milwaukee, Cleveland, until they play at Detroit again, which will be mid-December. So I don't know. that Somebody had texted me when they were 10 and whatever, three, and I said, I'll say 15 and 15. And then I was, no, I, may, I, I it was before that. It was before that. I don't think I would have been that ballsy about it. I think it was like eight and three. I was like, I think they'll be 15 and 15. That, that might be good at this point. Okay, keep it moving. What's another surprise team that's no longer a surprise? Spurs. The Spurs are now your 14th seed in the Western Conference. Only a half game up on Houston. They went from five and two to one and 13. 11th on offense. 20th on defense um, to 29th on offense to 30th on defense from November 1st to today. Their net rating from November 1st is minus 15. That's five points worse than the second worst net, net rating in the NBA. That's the Charlotte Hornets. So this is actually not surprising. We thought this was the worst roster in the league coming in. They have a chance to do something special record-wise here. I love Sohan. Calvin Johnson, his numbers have increased. Uh, the shooting isn't exactly where I'd like it to be. I do like him as a player. I'm a little worried he might be best player, guy takes the most shots on a really bad basketball team. Although Vassell's tied with Keldon, leading scorer, and he's 42% from three. So there's a couple little pieces here that I like, but this is a bad basketball team. Um, here's a number from Shulman at NBA.com. The Spurs had a five-game stretch where they didn't have a lead past the 857 mark of the first quarter. So it was like, hey, we're tipping this up. You're never going to have the lead. Sorry. So there's not much more there on the Spurs. So if you were asking yourself, like, where are the standing surprises here? Is Sacramento a surprise at six? Maybe they're a surprise at six. They've lost three in a row. I still like them. Uh, to me, they're a top 10 West team. I think the only thing you're looking at here on who's out in the West would be what you would think Minnesota. I still thought they'd have a nice regular season. This has been a disaster for them. They're tough to even watch. And now Towns is out for four weeks. I don't know if that might help them just to, instead of fighting this Gobert Towns thing where they do split them up. Like the Murray, uh, Trey Young stuff, I keep paying attention to. Like they really split those guys up as much as they can and they close because you can't have one of those guys on the bench when you're closing when you have these two players. But there's some teams here that have roster situations where it's like they're trying to get away with splitting guys up a little bit more. And I don't know the full minutes on off for all the stuff that's happening with uh, Towns and Gobert, but guess what? Towns is going to be around for a few weeks. So it feels like Sacramento against Minnesota against the top 10 thing. And, uh, yeah, the rest of it here, Oklahoma City, San Antonio, Houston, Lakers, although AD's been a lot better. The Westbrook stuff off the bench has been terrific. I think what we're looking at here is maybe Sacramento against Minnesota for that spot wherever that would land there. 
Uh, unless the Lakers, I mean, they're two and a half out of a 10 seed here. I just don't think it's impossible, even though we don't like the, the roster. Speaking of the Lakers, hand up here. I was watching the Pacers game on Monday. We're going to talk a little Pacers, don't worry. Nemhart hits the game winning three. LeBron was on him. And Turner missed a wide open three. Then it was an offensive rebound by Halliburton. And then LeBron was kind of stuck in like, do I help towards Matherin, who was on the baseline? Or do I stay out of my guy? He just stopped paying attention to Nemhart. Nemhart's wide open, hits the game winning three. I played the video and was like, LeBron lost his guy. Knowing that it was a scramble and off the offensive rebound, I thought and I went, you know, this is an entirely fair. And although I do think because there was a pro argument and I watched all the post game stuff. So it was interesting because LeBron, when he was asked about the last play, immediately was like, well, there was a screw up on the Miles Turner one, which he's saying. And Russ went way too deep to trail the ball handler because he had no chance to come back. Turner misses the three and it's kind of a scramble. So when it's a scramble, a lot of your assignments get kind of thrown out. What I wouldn't want a player doing is leaving a guy wide open to hit a game winning three. Now you can argue that LeBron was stuck in it, but this is what happens, especially when you're older and you're tired. You can look like you're closing out on something that's two feet away as opposed to 20 feet away. I don't think Matherin was even going to get a pass from uh, Halliburton on that side when you look at that angle because Anthony Davis is in front of him. So the pass, I don't even think, is getting through. And then even if it does, Davis is probably blocking the shot as Matherin's trying to finish behind him in a very tight quarters with no time to make any kind of decision. So instead, LeBron leaves Nemhart completely open. But I did think it was a little unfair because it was a scramble, so I deleted it. So again, not a hero. Troops are heroes. But there's just so much that goes on in these plays at times where you can know, what about this? What about that? Because then I started watching all the post games. Like, I wonder what people are going to say about that last play. And there were ex-players that had some varying opinions on like what it was. Uh, I don't I don't think you need to help defend AD in that spot. But as you're looking, going, oh, my God, is this guy wide open? It's because you've completely dismissed Nebhart as even an option. And he was completely open. He actually took a lot of shots. So it wasn't like this. Who's this? I mean, there's a. There's also a part of this where LeBron could be like, Neb who? Like, what the fuck are you talking about? You're going to pay attention to him? But you got to pay attention to the Pacers because they're the four seed right now in the East. They're 12 and 8. Um, there's just a lot of average stats. They're 11th on offense. They're 13th on defense. They're net 12th. Halliburton's a leap guy. Look at the last three years. Leap, leap, leap. Leading the NBA in assists. 20 and 11 on average. 40% from three for his career. 49% from the floor this year. Matherin is a stud. Just taking names. Not afraid of anybody. They don't let him start. Yeah, the only thing he's afraid of is the lineup card. Uh, Turner's been really good for them. And Duarte's missed half the season. They have a lot of average stats, but there's something that's funny with Rick Carlisle and what I processed into last year when I was trying to figure out like the over-unders is that Rick Carlisle always finds a way to deliver. Remember some of those Dallas teams that didn't make a ton of sense over the years, right? And then you're like, wow, how do they end up winning? And I'm, don't even take it from me. There'd be other NBA guys you would talk to that would just go, man, Rick Carlisle again. Maybe he's back to doing it. Maybe he's back to doing it. This is a team that you thought after 25 and 57 – like, how good could they possibly be? I don't think they're a four seed. If you're looking at the surprises, you know, Miami's at this point, the 11th, Chicago's 12th. Chicago's got a league worst two and eight record in clutch games. We already talked about Patrick Williams. Miami's the 11th seed. Chicago's 12th. Miami's 10 and 11, but Butler's missed eight games. So I'm not saying the Pacers necessarily, like, they'd probably be on the replace watch there a little bit, but he's got this team rolling. Um, but I'm not sure. They're not a top four team in the East. No. No.